nine. But I think it's important actually to, to go back and take the long view of history to understand the processes uh, that, that kind of unfolded in that period. To so go back to the, the sort of early 19th century. Um, and this is because of Cuba's unique position in the Spanish empire. You know, while you had this enormous wave of revolutions across the Latin American continent, forged all these nation states by 1830, you had no such movement in Cuba at all. Uh, and this was largely because, uh, unlike the, the other colonies of the, of the Spanish Empire, Cuba was heavily reliant on, on slavery in a way that other uh, colonies weren't. And this sort of had the, the, the effect of discouraging uh, elements of the Cuban bourgeoisie from engaging in a revolution. Because uh, obviously to engage in a revolution would be to risk uh, the phenomena of what happened in, in, in Haiti, where there was a, a sort of a revolution had taken place uh, in France and in, inspired a slave revolt against uh, slave masters. You know, the Spanish state served this Cuban bourgeoisie uh, in defending it from uh, its, its own slaves, essentially. Now, this also kind of had a kind of dialectical impact in the sense that because slavery prevented um, Cuba from breaking from the Spanish Empire, and, it, you know, because it was then uh, remaining part of the Spanish Empire um, through the 19th century, slavery itself then uh, became more and more important in the Cuban economy. Cuba's economy developed more and more intensely into a colonial economy uh, that was basically servicing uh, the Spanish market and also the American market increasingly uh, for sort of key raw commodities produced by enormous slave plantations. These were sort of sugar, tobacco and coffee. And this sort of this kind of uh, economic production became dominant in Cuba and it only intensified over the course of the 19th century. And it had important implications um, for the Cuban bourgeoisie. So on the one hand, as I've already sort of spoke, spoken about, this importance of slavery tied it heavily uh, to, to Spain, right? It, Spain offered its security from uh, its own slave class. But it also stifled uh, economic development. You know, in, in some ways, <clears throat> Cuba was comparable to the, the American South in, in that uh, the predominance of slavery meant it was actually relatively backwards, unable to develop uh, with the new industrial techniques that were being developed uh, in Europe and in the northern parts of the United States. And that also has important implications for what goes on in the 20th century, the sort of weakness of the Cuban bourgeoisie. Now, an important development uh, in the 19th century was uh, America's reprisals against Spanish protectionism. So because Cuba was part of, of the Spanish empire, all uh, the sort of Cuban market was protected by the, the trade policies and tariffs uh, of Spain which sort of uh, were an attempt, obviously, to, to protect uh, Spanish uh, economic interests in the region. And this meant that American exports were basically unable to sort of penetrate the, the Cuban economy. And this, this uh, was responded to with uh, American tariffs being raised on uh, Cuban coffee and Cuban tobacco. And what that meant was is, uh, America, by the sort of 1840s, had become the dominant market for Cuban produce. And when tariffs were introduced, obviously, it just sort of plummeted uh, the sort of export market for these key commodities. And this alienated uh, sort of coffee and tobacco producers in Cuba from, um, from the Spanish state, right? They know now all of a sudden what Spanish rule meant for this section of society was it meant a massive uh, loss of profits and being unable to access its largest uh, market. And so this actually culminated eventually in 1868 to a 10 years war. Um, which, which uh, was led by a figure called Manuel de, de Cespedes, uh, who was a sort of plantation owner, a tobacco plant, plantation owner, I believe. He sort of kind of freed his own slaves and led a, a revolt against the, the Spanish uh, state. Now, ultimately, it was unsuccessful. Uh, after, after a prolonged kind of 10 years uh, guerrilla war, it came, it came to, to an end uh, with, Spanish, with the Spanish rule still in place. And this was largely because the most powerful elements of the Cuban bourgeoisie were around sugar plantations and the sugar interests had not been affected by US reprisals in this period. And so there's only really a small section of the Cuban bourgeoisie that broke with the Spanish state um, <clears throat> and, and actually decided to fight against uh, the Spanish monarchy. So that struggle uh, you know, did, was, was unsuccessful ultimately. And then, but then there are important developments over the 19th century. So in 1886, you get the abolition of slavery, right? And this is obviously important from what I was saying earlier, the importance of slavery in maintaining that link um, between um, Cuba's bourgeoisie uh, to the Spanish crown, that kind of protection that it offered from slavery, that was no longer there. You know, this, this kind of sword of Damocles that was hanging over the ruling class was taken away. 
Uh, and perhaps even more importantly, in 1892, the United States introduced tariffs on Spanish sugar. And that was that had profound consequences for the island. Sugar, as I said, was that was by far the most dominant of the sort of three main monoculture produced uh, commodities in Cuba. And uh, once once the United States introduced these these tariffs on um, Cuban sugar, there was absolutely no incentive uh, for the, this Cuban bourgeoisie to remain a part of the Spanish Empire. And this was really the the, the motor force behind the events of 1895, where uh, sort of. Cuba's national hero, Jose Martí, uh, led a guerrilla war against the Spanish uh, beginning in 1895 in the Orient province. Uh, <clears throat> and I mean, it was an extremely successful uh, struggle against the Spanish. It was you know, effectively by uh, 1898, the, the, Cuba, the Cubans had, had driven uh, the Spanish out of uh, most places in Cuba and had pushed them definitely on the back foot uh, because this time the most powerful elements of the Cuban uh, bourgeoisie were sort of united behind the struggle. They'd also been able to bring in popular elements as well, because Jose Marti's program was a bourgeois democratic program, right? He was offering uh, Cubans the opportunity to vote, um, which they'd obviously never had before as a, as a colonial subject people, um, and this kind of thing, and, and obviously the promises of, of sovereignty and this kind of thing. So it mobilized a popular base as well. But, you know, despite the fact that they were on the verge of victory, we'll never quite know whether they would have achieved it or not, because in 1898, uh, you had the uh, intervention of US imperialism. Now, that there was an incident called the USS Maine incident, where the United States basically sent a warship into Havana's harbor, which uh, all of a sudden kind of blew up. Uh, now, when, I'm not one for conspiracy theories. Who's to know what, what transpired? But either way, uh, the, this destruction of the ship was used as a kind of casus belli, a justification for America's uh, intervention um, in, into the, the Spanish-Cuban War and, and declared war on Spain. And so you have this sort of Spanish-American War, which is over very quickly, uh, and it ele- enables the United States to take control of uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And of course, they still own Puerto Rico today. Um, and so what this meant was that the revolution, uh, revolutionary movement from the Cuban perspective was completely sort of cut off uh, and usurped by uh, US imperialism. Um, and now four years, for four years, there was a sort of a, a military rule established by, by the United States. Uh, they ruled over Cuba directly militarily. For in 1892, uh, they proclaimed uh, the sort of the Cuban Republic. But the only sort of, you know, whilst this was meant to be this great historic moment of Cuba finally having achieved its uh, national uh, sort of sovereignty and independence, it was completely undermined um, by uh, the, by U.S. imperialism essentially. And the, re- and the way in which it was uh, undermined was something called the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment essentially was an amendment to the Cuban Constitution uh, that was promulgated um, in 1902, which was essentially like, if if, the United States deemed that there there was chaos or instability on the the Cuban island, they could militarily intervene. Uh, And along along with this, it also gave them the infamous uh, naval base in Guantanamo, which obviously today is uh, the site of their their torture camp. this meant that effectively, um, you know, Cuban sovereignty was completely compromised. You know, at this point, the American ability to, to intervene in Cuban politics was immensely significant. Now, you actually, um, the, you know, the reason to explain why, why, was, why were the U.S. so keen on intervening politically in Cuban affairs it was precisely because they'd inter- intervened so directly in Cuba's e- economy. They'd used the uh, sort of devastation and the, up- the upheaval of the struggle against the Spanish. They used that to, uh, to take hold of several uh, sort of Cuban holdings, holdings of land, holdings of, uh, of refineries and so on and so forth. Um, I kind of realized that this, as the sun's coming down, I'm sort of half entering shadow. Um, I don't know if it might be worth me uh, kind of turning my light on. Um, so give me one second. But yeah. Good show. Hey, as I was saying, yeah, um, you know, this 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 meant essentially that the United States um, had became extremely dominant in the Cuban economy. And to, just to, to quote you uh, some statistics to really kind of outline the extent of, of U.S. dominance. Um, so, in, uh, in in 1959, which is obviously on the eve of the Cuban uh, rev- Revolution, um, or rather the the, the overthrow of Batista. Um, in 1959, the United States owned 40% of Cuba's sugar-producing land, owned 80% of its mines and mineral resources, 
There were 90% of its utilities and the entire oil industry. Now, these uh, figures were not uh, quoted by Fidel Castro. They weren't quoted uh, from Marxist.com. These were figures given by John F. Kennedy uh, in a report as to why had the situation in Cuba gone the way it had. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it, this, this shows the extent to which uh, the Ameri Amer American imperialism had come to dominate the Cuban island and explains why they were so interested in dominating Cuba politically. Now, as a reaction to this, you, you, you have a situation uh, in, in Cuba where obviously this great bourgeois democratic revolution had been completely undermined. Uh, this, you know, this intense struggle and enormous sacrifice had been completely usurped by the interests of US imperialism. And this eventually culminates in a, in a sort of revolution in 1933, which is basically a sergeant's coup led by Batista, uh, who, will, who will come to be an important uh, figure later on. And essentially it's bourgeois democratic in nature. Uh, it's a coalition of students, some privileged layers of workers and, and the petty bourgeoisie. And it officially ends the Platt Amendment. So the Platt Amendment is revoked from the, the Cuban constitution, which nominally brings an end to US imperialism. Of course, it doesn't really bring an end um, to US imperialism. But then uh, one of the crucial things and one of the crucial sort of outcomes of the 1933 uh, revolution or the 1933 um, sergeant's coup is that it, it, brings, it brings the masses onto, this, onto the scene uh, in, in Cuban politics. And it Im immediately puts this sort of new regime under immense pressure from the workers. Now, this, this actually uh, culminates in the 1940 constitution, uh, which is promulgated by uh, Batista. Um, but it's a constitution which is actually fairly progressive. It includes a, a number of sort of social rights as well as political rights, uh, which means, you know, guarantees of uh, certain working conditions, the guarantee uh, to unionize and this kind of thing. So it's progressive in this, in this sense. And, uh, and, and, and this is all off the back of the sort of immense uh, pressure um, of, of uh, basically the advanced working class and workers organizations that were brought into the struggle in the 19th into the 1930s and 40s. But it's important now also to discuss the role of the Popular Socialist Party. This was, a, this was the Communist Party of, uh, of Cuba, it was, but it was titled the Popular Socialist Party. Now, despite the, its origins of being like a very healthy uh, Communist Party, it was founded by a, a, a man called uh, Julio uh, Meyer, who was um, actually like a fairly Trotskyist in his outlook. He was, he was assassinated now, it's controversial as to whether he was assassinated by the Cuban state or whether he was assassinated by Stalinists. It's, it's unclear. But what, what did occur in the, in the Cuban Socialist Party um, was a, a kind of degeneration, basically, along Stalinist lines. And actually, that they took the position of aligning itself um, with Batista itself. And so the Popular Socialist Party formed a kind of part of the ruling coalition with Batista in government. Now, what that allowed it to do was achieve certain, some of these economic reforms, increases in wages and working conditions and so on in this period. But it also meant that they completely sort of discredited themselves in the eyes of the most advanced workers. And this has important implications for the revolutionary struggle in the 1950s. Now, I'll go on to talk a, a bit about, uh, you know, the, how this sort of unfolds, basically. So you have the situation in which uh, wages and working conditions are improving, but this obviously comes uh, up against a reaction. And uh, driving that reaction is U.S. imperialism. Essentially, these these gains of uh, by, um, by by the Cuban working class um, were cutting into American profits. And you know, the, the more like obviously the, the greater uh, wages that these workers were being paid, the less profit they were the bosses were able to make. And likewise, uh, the same goes for improvements to working conditions in the working day. And so this was this became became a you know, this led to a situation in which the Cuban government was beginning to, to come under immense pressure from uh, the United States to reel this process back in, to, to reverse uh, these reforms, basically. Um, and the democratic governments proved almost entirely incapable of, uh, of delivering uh, on, on that. And so eventually, the United States uh, moved uh, behind Batista again to launch a military coup, which he does in 1952, and in launching his military coup, he basically, um, you know, he, he brings an end to this period of kind of workers' reforms and so forth, immediately goes on the offensive against uh, the work, workers' institutions and this kind of thing, and workers' rights. Amazingly, still doesn't lose the sort of tacit support of the Popular Socialist Party or, um, 
or of the trade union movement. He still managed, they, they still uh, continue to back uh, the idea of a coalition with, with him in this period. Um, but this is, this is what unfolds in the early 1950s. And this occurs at a time in which uh, living standards are actually falling uh, in, in Cuba. So you have a situation in which um, they, they're still, Cuba is still reliant on, on sugar, which was um, its main export, obviously, throughout the 19th century. We've sort of discussed the importance of that already. You have a situation in, in which it, uh, now, though, it has a major global competitors, which means that the price of sugar as a commodity is collapsing uh, through the 1940s and 50s. And so actually what you get a process in the 1950s is, is of GDP per capita uh, falling for the 1950s, so living standards falling through the 50s. Um, and likewise, this is all happening uh, at a time where you have uh, 700,000 people permanently unemployed. That's about 15 to 20% like chronic unemployment. Uh, and that's on top of a whole layer of people who are uh, sort of permanently underemployed. So they kind of do um, seasonal work in, 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 in agriculture or being kind of laid to idleness for months just about surviving through the year. And this was the, the situation in Cuba you know, intensifying poverty and coupled with actually like open splits in the, in the ruling class. You have this kind of confrontation between uh, Batista and Ramon Grau and uh, Batista represented the elements of the Cuban bourgeoisie that wanted to basically subjugate itself to US imperialism without question. Whereas Ramon Grau represented a kind of idealistic section that believed that Cuba's relationship with America could be renegotiated uh, on, on a capitalist basis. And obviously, th obviously this was never going to happen. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, it did mean an open split uh, in the ruling class. And this is important because these are, these are the things that Marxists would identify as the kind of objective conditions, <clears throat> the objective conditions for revolution. You know, this, this is this, you know, in the 1950s, Cuba was ripe for a revolutionary movement to break out because so bad were the conditions, conditions were worsening, workers were moving into struggle. And, uh, and, and the ruling class was divided. These are the, the, the conditions that Lenin outlines as, as conditions um, for a revolutionary situation. But this is where uh, Fidel Castro kind of comes onto the scene uh, in, in, uh, in a spectacular fashion in July 26, 1953, with his attack on uh, the Moncada barracks in Santiago. Now, the, the attack itself is a complete farce. It's a complete failure. Um, the, the people that that carry out the attack either end up dead or arrested by the Cuban government. Um, <clears throat> and, and you know, it's 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 completely fails to inspire the, the revolutionary outbreak that was intended uh, you know, by the by the revolutionaries themselves. But it, what it does do is it serves to act um, as, as a kind of platform for Fidel Castro himself, particularly in his trial, um, in which he he sort of makes his, his famous de declaration that history would absolve him and uh, sort of outlines the program of the July 26th movement, um, obviously named after this attack, in which, which are, are largely bourgeois democratic demands, uh, but also he, he also links, you know, talk, discusses uh, the sort of social ills in Cuba and the need to eliminate these, but he's quite vague as to how that's going to happen. And anyway, so obviously uh, that's th this, uh, in the end, this, this sort of revolutionary struggle develops with uh, Fidel Castro returning after he'd been exiled uh, to Mexico, returning in 1956, uh, to, to lead a guerrilla struggle uh, in, this, in the Sierra Maestra, kind of uh, emulating the actions of Jose Marti in 1895. Um, and, and this is the sort of famous element of the Cuban revolution, right? This sort of guerrilla struggle, which by just a handful of, of fighters uh, against the, the uh, Cuban government. But there are also other important struggles going on at the same time. You have uh, an urban movement. So you have, um, in March 13th, you, for instance, you have students attempting to assassinate uh, Batista um, and, and failing in in uh, in April, on April the uh, the ninth, nineteen fifty nine. You have a, a general strike call by the July twenty sixth movement, but this is actually quite a dismal failure because they don't work basically in the workers' organisations to to foster the general strike. They just sort of declare it from uh, the position as urban and rural guerrillas, and it doesn't quite connect up with the, the workers' movement. What is important to stress is that there is a movement of the working class building uh, in this period. And actually, um, as, as successful as the guerrilla struggle would prove to be against Batista and kind of driving him out of uh, about half of Cuba by uh, the summer of 1959, it was the uh, general strike that was launched in 1959 in, in Havana that really brought, brought an end to Batista's regime. This was the crucial death blow to Batista. Uh, 
and it and and, and it's just, it was a decisive intervention by the masses into the process of, of of the of the sort of struggle against the Batista uh, regime, and it was <clears throat> essentially without this general strike, it is it is potential that, that you know the struggle could have went a, a very different way, and it was the the, the intervention uh, of the masses basically proved to Batista that the game was up. There was absolutely no way to carry on ruling uh, in Cuba, and so he decided to flee with his millions to the Dominican Republic, and then on on his way to Florida, and. Uh, this is, you know, this is an important uh, point. It's often overlooked in, in a lot of the histories of the Cuban Revolution, part, you know, obviously because uh, the leaders of the, the guerrilla struggle would, would take leadership of the revolution and, and would form the basis of the, of the revolutionary government. Their struggle is obviously uh, front uh, and center of the kind of story of the Cuban Revolution. It's important to remember uh, the role of the general strike. Now, this probably is, is a good time to discuss uh, the problems of the Foucault theory. So the Foucault theory was the theory developed uh, by Che Guevara, obviously one of the most famous of the Cuban revolutionaries, um, which was the idea that <clears throat> you could basically take a kind of dedicated core of, of people and uh, begin a kind of guerrilla struggle that would serve to inspire uh, the masses to revolution and that would effectively create the objective conditions for revolution itself. Now, this was a complete misinterpretation of what had actually went on in Cuba. It wasn't a case that when, when um, Castro uh, arrived on the Granma, which was this small boat in uh, the Sierra Maestra, that he created um, the mood for revolution in Cuba, it was present. Uh, and in fact, uh, there, were, there were strike waves uh, breaking out throughout the 1950s. Um, what they, instead they had done, they simply expressed the discontent of the existing society and offered a leadership. And this, this comes back to the discrediting of the unions and the, and the popular socialist party. They were in no position to offer revolutionary leadership because of their kind of treacherous collaboration with Batista. And so someone, a kind of this maverick figure in the form of Fidel Castro was able to offer that leadership because he was he had not discredited himself by aligning himself with Batista at any point uh, in, in the struggle. Now, um, that's, I think this, you know, that's, that's a, an, an important uh, aspect of the Cuban revolution, a really important lesson uh, of the, the Cuban revolution. But the, you know, but the Foucault theory, um, Obviously, it would it'd be proved, uh, it was proved wrong in its kind of tragic uh, circumstances, right? Like it's exporting to Latin America would prove disastrous. And ultimately, it's kind of uh, progenitor, uh, Che Guevara, would, would, would learn that lesson in the, in the most bitter of circumstances with his assassination in 1967 by the CIA <clears throat> in his attempts to spread revolution to Bolivia. It was proved that uh, yeah, this idea and this notion that uh, could could be the driving force of revolution and just simply was, isn't the case. Now, I think that's kind of focal theory dealt with. We can, we can touch upon that in discussion if people have any more questions. Kind of move on to the sort of initial uh, phase of, the, of the, the Cuban revolution after it took power. So you have um, this, this um, essentially the Cuban revolution was this bourgeois democratic revolution, right? It's, its ultimate aim was the, was the complete independence and sovereignty of Cuba, which which had obviously not been achieved as a result of the usurping uh, of the of U.S. imperialism uh, in the early 20th century, and, and obviously right the way through uh, to the 1950s. And this uh, this program involved agrarian reform, which is a kind of key bourgeois democratic demand to sort of transform land relations to to, to break the power of a kind of um, a, a kind of powerful landlord class. And so this this was promulgated in uh, May 17th, 1959. Uh, with the redistribution of state assets and the assets uh, of kind of Batista and his and his kind of henchmen, these were redistributed to to peasants uh, who were previously landless. You had a house building program which was extremely extensive in rural areas to provide housing where previously there'd only really been sort of shanties uh, in place before. And then you had a, a policy in urban areas of cutting rent by fifty percent <clears throat> and then allowing tenants to purchase their homes at extremely low prices. And another thing the Cuban government it straight away was it implemented 25 to 30 percent wage increases across uh, the board of the, of the Cuban economy. But this program, uh, although quite bold and, and, and radical, um, quickly reached its limits with, within capitalism. Essentially, you had a situation in which the land reform uh, that, that was, you know, ran, in, it ran out of land to, to sort of allocate these peasants and required, therefore, much more radical redistribution if it was to offer uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of landless peasants that had not yet uh, obtained a parcel of land. 
essentially Cuba would have to confront uh, these sort of US corporations holdings of land and, and these big uh, Cuban, Cuban landlords that had not yet been expropriated. Likewise, with the house building program, it was, it was very limited. And ultimately, the conclusion that was drawn was that uh, the sort of um, house building uh, corporations would have to be nationalized if they were to ever achieve uh, this extremely ambitious and bold program of house building. And so these, these sort of conclusions uh, were being drawn continuously by Cuban uh, revolutionaries. But actually, even more importantly, was the intervention of the masses themselves throughout this period? Uh, you've got the you've got you've got these sort of um, spontaneous seizures of, of industries and factories and so on throughout Cuba, and also uh, by not just by workers, but also by peasants in terms of seizures of, uh, of plantations and land and so on. So you've actually got the revolution radicalizing um, way beyond the sort of the, the sort of whatever the the revolutionary government itself could would have possibly foreseen, right? And they have to almost kind of catch up to the, this sort of radicalization, this radical intervention of the masses. And I think this is this brings us on to quite a, an interesting uh, kind of point, right? Like US imperialism obviously was reacting extremely negatively uh, to these revolutionary, uh, tr this revolutionary process in Cuba. And initially, it had thought that it could potentially work with, <clears throat> uh, with, with the Castro regime. But it quickly became apparent that this, the forces unleashed by this revolution not even Castro could control it in, in, in many ways. And, uh, you know, and quickly the U.S. began to put sort of pressure on the Cuban government. You have to hold back. You have to uh, no, no more land reforms. Uh, we want guarantees of our private property and our investments and so on and so forth. And quite quickly, U.S. imperialism, therefore, uh, confronted uh, this Cuban assertion of sovereignty. And it became very apparent to, um, to, the, to the Cuban revolutionary government that if Cuba was to assert its national sovereignty, it would have to kick out U.S. imperialism in a confrontational manner. And this, I think, is where Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution comes in. Now, it's interesting because bourgeois historians obsess over this question of whether Fidel Castro was this uh, lifelong Marxist and he just kept it hidden uh, during the revolutionary process, or whether he was this conniving figure who angered the U.S. So he looked at who, who's uh, the U.S.'s number one enemy. It's the Soviet Union. I'll become a Marxist. This, this question, they obsess over it, but it essentially is unimportant because what actually ma matters is the revolution, as I've said, is radicalizing way beyond uh, the, the, the uh, boundaries of, of an individual leader. Um, you know, the, the masses are intervening in, in, uh, in the sort of um, stage of history, if you like, already. And uh, essentially, what was important is the fact that the bourgeoisie, the Cuban bourgeoisie, was in no position uh, to, to be a base from which to carry out bourgeois democratic reforms. I've explained in the, in the talk earlier, they were incredibly weak as a class uh, as a result of the domination of, you know, historic domination of Spanish colonialism and the domination of U.S. imperialism. They were tied to U.S. imperialism. They had no interest in breaking with U.S. imperialism. And so this class couldn't be relied on to carry out bourgeois democratic demands. And that, so it was on, upon the Cuban masses that, that that program had to be carried out. But of course, in carrying that out, they have demands of their own as a class. And this meant ultimately, of course, the breaking with capitalism itself. And this is what happens uh, in, through 1960. You get this radicalization of the revolution that's recognized and, and sort of uh, taken, taken on board by the, the Cuban government. They uh, nationalize and expropriate U.S. corporations in August 1960. But by the end of the year, 90% <clears throat> of the Cuban economy is in state hands. And that's kind of the, uh, the process that unfolds uh, in Cuba. And uh, now it's, I might just talk quickly or briefly if, if I have time, Cal, uh, let me know if uh, it's all right. Yeah. Um, to, about the role of the Soviet Union, right? Like I've touched upon it, how the uh, bourgeois historians will kind of obsess over it. And the thing is, is another thing that they miss is the fact that the Soviet Union was not, in this period was not playing the role of trying to radicalize Cuba's revolution. In fact, it was doing the exact opposite. The Soviet Union was, was, had a policy of uh, peaceful coexistence, uh, which basically essentially meant that it did, it, it did not want to spread a socialist revolution throughout the world. If it could gain a friendly or allied government uh, somewhere, then that was obviously beneficial and it would play these sort of geopolitical uh, games with, with uh, the United States and so on and so forth. But the spread of a genuine revolution beyond their control, essentially, was a terrifying prospect for the Soviet bureaucracy. And so they were constantly throughout 1959 and throughout 1960, 
uh, telling Castro to slow down, to halt his program of reforms, uh, and and to not, um, put, you know, rock the boat with the United States, as it were. I think that's a really important point: is that the pressure of radicalizing the revolution came from the Cuban masses, not from uh, the like the, the uh, nefarious uh, um, agents of Moscow. And it's a, it's a, it's an absurd assertion by um, kind of these some of these bourgeois academics. Now, obviously. Um, one of the things that does move Cuba into the, the Soviet Union's kind of sphere and into the Soviet bloc is uh, the U.S. retaliation, right? Like the U United States retaliates against Cuba with uh, an embargo, and obviously with the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, in 1961, where the CIA-trained exiles uh, attempt to overthrow um, Castro and utterly fail. Um, this sort of sealed Cuba's place in the socialist bloc. And that obviously had important impl implications as well. But uh, I think it is really important for us to, to recognize that the Soviet Union uh, did not play the, the, this majorly progressive role that it's accredited with by, by its, ironically, by its opponents. Um, and I think now I just kind of end by, by talking about the, the gains of this, of this uh, revolution. Um, obviously, like uh, comrades may well be aware of that Cuba, Cuba obviously has this kind of remarkable uh, healthcare system and, and so on and so forth. And, this was really off the back of the planned economy that Cuba was able uh, to implement. If, if it were, weren't for the, the, the planned economy, it would not have been able to arrive at a position where it has uh, the second most uh, number of doctors per 1,000 in the world, where it has a literacy rate of 99.75%, and where it's taken enormous strides in eliminating racial inequality. One of the things that the Cuban Revolution did was because uh, the, the sort of the Cuban uh, states took, took over the role of a uh, of employment, essentially, it eradicated many of the sort of color bars that existed in, in Cuban industry that barred Afro-Cubans from some of the more uh, higher paid uh, jobs in, in the Cuban economy. That was eliminated by the Cuban revolution, which meant uh, progress towards much more genuine equality between uh, white and Afro-Cuban. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, gain of the revolution. Now, of course, uh, the revolution wasn't perfect. We would not talk about Cuba having established socialism. Like ultimately, you know, we believe that socialism in one country isn't possible. And I think that's, a, that's important to stress. Um, and if it wasn't possible in the Soviet Union, it certainly wasn't possible uh, in an island of 12 million people with very limited natural resources. That, that's, uh, un, you know, undoubted essentially. Uh, and there, there are all sorts of limitations. Uh, there are still, you know, a degree of, um, of bureaucratic control right from the beginning, which only intensified uh, over the course of, of the 20th century, uh, bureaucratic control of the economy, there's no real workers' democracy in Cuba and this kind of thing. And, and there are these limitations and so on and so forth. But I think really the Cuban revolution should still be seen as an, an enormously inspiring event. Essentially, the intervention of the masses uh, at key, key moments uh, of, of struggle in, in the struggle against Batista, in the processes uh, that unleashed afterwards in, in defending the Cuban revolution from uh, U.S. imperialism. All these times, all these events prove that the power of the masses could overcome the most powerful uh, imperialist power in history, just 90 miles away. And I think that's something of immense inspiration. Something I think inspired inspired people um, across the world uh, when it happened, and I think continues to inspire people uh, to this day. So I'll, I'll end. I'll leave it there. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Kieran. Um, I'm just going to cancel your spotlight now. Um, okay, great. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and see me. Um, uh, that was an excellent talk. I uh, hope everyone's keeping well at home as well. Uh, I just wanted to update uh, people that are part of the chat and also people that are part of the uh, watching on through Facebook or YouTube that we have just a hundred people on uh, just under a hundred people on this call, and we've got sixty people watching on the live stream on Facebook. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's it's been a, an excellent um, turnout. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, if you if you want to raise your hand, like if you want to contribute in the discussion, uh, depending on how many people raise their hand, I'll bring you in and I'll make you a panelist and I'll demote you afterwards. But if you just have a question, you can ask the question through the uh, the Q and A function, which I think you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, okay, great. Yeah. So we've got Nick that wants to speak. I have some thoughts as well, but I'm not going to abuse my privilege as, uh, as chair. 
so yeah, we've got Nick joining us now on the panel. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hi, Nick. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Right, that's uh, that's good then. Um, yes, I've done it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to to comment about the, the question ultimately of why we're discussing the the Cuban Revolution. Though, as um, as Keelan ended on, it's a tremendously inspiring uh, event, um, and obviously, you know, it's it, it's one. That being so inspiring, you know, you, you can have an aspect of romanticization under all this. At the end of the day, that's not really why uh, we um, uh, we study it and why we're all here discussing it today. I think uh, the, the most important point is the Cuban revolution has shown the merits of a planned economy. You just look at the situation today, you know, Cuba is suffering far less from the, uh, from the coronavirus. Uh, than any other country, but not only that, it's sending its doctors all over the world. This is, as you say, a tiny country of, what, what was it, 12 million inhabit inhabitants, um, which in the 1960s had uh, very backwards e economic conditions, and it's managed to pull through with the planned economy, augment uh, the, the, the rate of literacy and all of this. Um, but at the same time, it's under threat. Uh, I think I, and I don't know everything about the context of where Cuba's going now. I think I'd like uh, you to talk about it a bit more, maybe. But um, uh, it is a, a revolution that right now is on the border of, you know, more trade deals for, with the US uh, and of going, veering back towards uh, capitalism. And all, all of these gains uh, are, are at risk of being lost. And uh, this raises a question, really, you know, why is this happening? You raise the question, we wouldn't characterize Cuba necessarily as a, as a socialist economy. It has a basis materially in terms of the social relations um, uh, that are necessary for a socialist economy, but it isn't there yet. And it, it isn't mere pedantry. And contrary to you know our opponents, what they would say is, oh, you're just raising this because uh, you, you don't support the Cuban revolution or anything like this, which is complete uh, nonsense, of course. But what we mean by a socialist revolution is one uh, where the, the, the masses consciously take control of production in the greatest conscious sleep uh, ever seen in, in history uh, and plan the economy in a, in, in a democratic way. Only then can you take things forward. That isn't exactly what happened in Cuba. You know, there, there was this question of guerrilla tactics. Uh, and ultimately, even though the work Nations, took over industries and all of this. They didn't have their own workers' leadership to take control. It was a militaristic, centralized, uh, or bureau bureaucratically centralized leadership, you could say, that took control. And as Marx has explained, since uh, the, that kind of state emerged in the Soviet Union, that can always only go uh, one of two ways. Either that bureaucracy can be overthrown. Um, by a democratic revolution of, of workers and, uh, and peasants or who all veer back into capitalism. And that's precisely the point, that in order to, to save the Cuban revolution, not only do you need to have another political revolution in that country, but you need a world revolution to save it. Uh, and that's, that's why I think we're discussing the, these questions and uh, discussing these lessons. Um, you know, the, the, the point is we need to, to, to learn and educate ourselves and organise uh, a revolutionary leadership for the working class. Um, I wasn't finding myself, I hope I didn't go over there. No, that was fine. Thank you very much for the contribution. I'm now going to demote you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think a really important point that Nick just touched upon is the superiority of a planned economy. And a video that has, been, has gone viral quite recently is Fidel Castro talking about how in the in in the darkest hour he is not going to be sending bombs abroad he's going to be sending doctors and you know that has really been vindicated after his death um because we see today that i think it's 18 countries so far have received some form of medical aid um you know doctors being sent around um to to deal with this crisis 
And we see what the imperialist powers are doing at this time as well, you know, that they're actually ramping up their imperialism. We only have to think about the war-torn Ye Yemen and how the US has actually quite recently pulled the plug on crucial aid, which most of uh, the majority of people rely upon. And also the uh, British state is making it easier for, um, for loans to be ta taken out, putting public money uh, forward in these loans uh, to, to the gangsters in Riyadh, um, basically to ramp up their imperialism. So we see a complete different response to this pandemic from Cuba um, uh, compared to, you know, the United States and Britain. Um, I, there, have you seen the questions on the Q&A function, Keelan? Yeah, 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 I'm happy to try and come back to a, a couple of them, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I think like a lot of people are asking um, about um, basically Cuba today, right? Like what are the, what are the perspectives um, for, for Cuba right now? I think uh, essentially we can take um, Trotsky's analysis of the Soviet Union and, um, and, and apply it to the Cuban situation. I think we can see a situation in which uh, Cuba has obviously um, got a planned economy, right? It's, it's introduced kind of socialist forms of, of production, but it requires, uh, but it has this uh, bureau bureaucracy uh, kind of dragging it, it down essentially. Um, and so there would, there would really need to be a political revolution uh, on the island to sort of bring the economy under workers' control rather than that of uh, a bureaucracy. I do think, obviously, ultimately, like it's the, it's the thing that I, uh, that I was saying before, right? Like it cannot achieve this on its, on its own. Right. Socialism in one country is 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 an absurdity, um, and it has, it's a particular absurdity for, for a Caribbean island. And I think uh, ultimately, if there, say there was to be a political revolution in Cuba, it would obviously one of its first tasks would be to call upon uh, the workers of of Central America, the Caribbean, Latin America, obviously the world ultimately, to to uh, take on their own uh, ruling classes and join them in this in this struggle. Um, and I, but I think, like, given um, the fact that in many ways, uh, Cuban workers and the, the advanced uh, Cuban workers are, are fighting a defensive struggle in Cuba, right? They're fighting to keep hold of the gains of the revolution. They're fighting against the, rest the, the creeping restoration of capitalism. Um, that I think ultimately, for, for sort of Cuba to to kind of advance along along these lines, it will be off the basis of international events, right? It'll be, you know, say there was to be a revolution somewhere else, that would act as an inspiration for Cuban workers, right? Like it's unlikely that that torch is going to be lit in Cuba, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think that's something that's important to, to bear in mind. Someone asked about um, the role of Raul Castro in, in this kind of return, uh, slow return of, um, of, of capitalism in, on the island. I think, I think Raul Castro obviously oversaw um, so, for instance, the liberalization of the housing market, right, which has had the disastrous effect mm. of introducing the scourge of homelessness, which had been largely eliminated by the Cuban Revolution um, until until 2008. And also, obviously, has, has, is leading to this uh, increasing social differentiation between those who own more than one property and those who don't. It's obviously the basis for a kind of layer of uh, petty bourgeois that will always be hostile towards uh, the, the Cuban government and this kind of thing. And it's very easy to kind of point at, at him and say, like, you know, like Fidel Castro was good and Raul Castro was bad. But I think it's better to kind of, I think you have to really see the processes that are, are, that are behind such a move, right? Like, ultimately, Raul Castro used to be considered the more communist of the two brothers. So why is it that it's him that seems to be implementing the capitalist reform? Well, it's because Cuba is obviously under this immense pressure, right? It's under immense ice. It was already suffered from significant isolation throughout the Cold War. But it always had the Soviet Union as an ally, right? It doesn't have that now. It has Venezuela, uh, mainly as its only real uh, ally on the international stage. And you know, the pressure that uh, Venezuela has been in uh, under, obviously, since um, Chavez took uh, since Chavez took power, obviously, uh, all the way through to through to, to today. And in fact, very recently, U.S. imperialism has really been ramping up against uh, Maduro. And, you know, it's a situ under these conditions of immense isolation. Uh, obviously. The pressures for the re the reimplementation of um, capitalism are significant, right? And I think that's the basis for it, right? Like to 
because social is one country is uh, has all these all these limitations ultimately unless you can sp spread that revolution like it's going to run into these contradictions and it's going to eventually be faced with a situation in which capitalist restoration comes back on the cards and you've got elements of the cuban bureaucracy talking about um you know a chinese a chinese solution or a vietnamese solution which is essentially coded for like capitalist restoration of course you also have a left faction and that you have a lot of a lot of cuban workers and young people in particular who are very hostile to, to that notion but that's you know the state the state of play uh, i hope i kind of answered uh, any questions on that yeah I th we've got people that want to come in now as well uh but i think that's a really important important point that you made this um this idea of peaceful coexistence with capitalist countries um this stalinist distortion actually of what a revolution is um and what a, what a revolution should should aim to be um and i think it's something that we saw with the the degeneration of the communist party which keelan was speaking about you know it was it was actually the communist party that backed batista um i think back in the late 30s um and you see like the one thing that Castro did differently and really tapped into uh, the mood of society at large was say no compromise on this point. We will not, you know, be in cahoots with Batista or his allies. Um, and they completely discredited themselves as a party um, in doing so. And it's because they subscribed to this idea of the stages theory of um, uh, Stalin's stages theory, which suggests that <laughs> you um in order to carry out bourgeois democratic reforms you must first lean on your national bourgeoisie but of course you know the the, the interests of the national bourgeois which is incredibly weak because of you know the the belated development the under the underdevelopment of uh, capitalism in cuba their interests actually align a lot more with the interests of the imperialists so you see them you know like the communist party jumping in bed thinking that this is the right policy to pursue. And something that really made Castro popular um, was actually, you know, he, he found this abhorrent and he, he made sure that, um, you know, there would be no deals with Batista. And I think that really tapped into the mood uh, in Cuba. Yeah, so we've got Pascal who wants to talk. So I'm gonna promote you to panelist now. Hopefully that will work. Hello, comrade. Uh, <laughs> all right, I want to speak a bit on this question on uh, actually on something that people who who apologize for capitalism, um, who would tell us that socialism is, is actually in fact much worse than it. Um, I'll talk, I want to talk about something that they often say, say, oh, you know, um, maybe socialism, like you can provide a little better for people or whatever. And we've already talked about, although I usually don't even mix the uh, uh, would uh, it wouldn't even accept that? But we've already talked about how the Cuban healthcare system is quite astounding, and how people, for example, have a longer life expectancy than in the United States, the richest country in the in history. Um, how maternal mortality rate is lower, um, and all of this on a very poor island nation, which is subject, let's not forget, to an imperialist embargo for I think the last sixty years. But in fact, I want to talk about also how the planned economy. Um, actually encourages innovation and encourages scientific progress contrary to what what people um who, who would support capitalism might say and and i think in, in this in this period in particular with the coronavirus uh wreaking havoc throughout the world uh we really see a distinction not only in how cuba cares for people um due to the planned economy but also in 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 what medicines are being developed so for example um there's a Cuban medicine called interferon B, which has already been used in, in mass trials very successfully to, to treat the symptoms that are caused um, by, the, by the novel coronavirus. Um, and looking back in history, um, Cuba has pioneered vaccines against meningitis. Since 2011, uh, people in Cuba have been able to receive a vaccine against lung cancer. Um, it's a shame, of course, that people in America can't receive that precisely because of the embargo. Um, but I think what this shows is, you know, that that centralization um, of research, where we get rid of, of sort of these co co this competition between pharmaceutical companies, um, 
where, where they actually double up assets. Um, and more importantly, um, in, in, in capitalism, the, the, the determinant factor of what is produced is, is profit, right? Um, and so in, in, say, America, the big pharmaceutical monopolies um, actually end up inve investing in so-called lifestyle drugs um, and drugs like drugs against, for example, obesity or, or you know, the, the 100th um, version of Viagra that they can patent for another 25 years. Um, in, when you have a planned economy, even when it's sort of on a bit of a bureaucratic basis, um, you can actually plan research for need as well. And that's, I think, really why, why Cuba was able to pioneer such vaccines when, when all, um, when in, in capitalist economies, um, treatments for, for, anti, like for antibiotics, for example, aren't even being researched. Um, and so, you know, I think when we're discussing how to fight the, the coronavirus crisis, I think that understanding has to be part of the answer. We have to you know, nationalize all these pharmaceutical companies now without compensation, because these parasites have been making enough profit, um, billions every year, um, of, of our illness. And, and we have to steer all the resources towards one goal, which is to find treatments against um, treatments for the coronavirus and vaccines against it. And I think it shows, in fact, the importance of the capitalist system that the capitalists are. Uh, they're so nervous about the, the lockdown being prolonged and what it's going to do to the world economy. And the effects are going to be devastating. Work, working people are already losing their jobs in record numbers. But one of the best ways, and I think perhaps the only sure way of cutting that short, um, would be to develop a vaccine um, or to develop treatment. And the best way to do that is simply to get rid of the profit motive in the pharmaceutical industry. But I think it's very revealing that that's something the, the capitalists are never going are never going to do um, and capitalist governments are never going to do and I think we discussed like the things Cuba is able to achieve um, on the basis of a very backward economy and again like on this impoverished island subject to an embargo and so I think it can really only serve as an inspiration for what we could achieve if the productive forces of the entire world um, were put in the service of, of progress and innovation and of mankind, humankind's needs. Um, and I think that's what we're fighting for. Thank you for that, Pascal. Uh, very inspiring note uh, to end on before I change your role to attending. Um, so have you, have you been keeping an eye <clears throat> on the Q&A function? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can come back. Someone's raised a question about kind of the relationship between Che Guevara and the Soviet Union, I can try and uh, give an answer to that. Well, I'd say gather your thoughts because Sam Tollett wants to come in and I'm promoting him <laughs> as a panelist. Um, but I'm gonna talk on the, the differences between the Cuban and the Venezuelan revolution. I'm not sure if you can see that on your side. Not at the moment. No worries. Hello, Sam. Hello? Hello? Hey, we've got you. I can hear you clearly. Okay, it doesn't look like my video is working, though. No worries, go, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, um, the national question in Cuba, because the Cuban Revolution um, you know, wasn't just looked at, was, wasn't just a, a socialist revolution. In fact, socialist revolution, in fact, it started out as, as, as this democratic revolution, as a struggle for national independence from, um, uh, from imperialism. And as, as Keelan's pointed out, um, because of how, um, how intertwined the Cuban and American economies were, how, how deeply this imperialism penetrated, it was impossible for Cuba to really have national independence to do um, for, for the, the revolutionary government to do what the Cuban people needed and wanted without um, expropriating capitalism without, uh, and, and breaking from capitalism, which you know, ultimately uh, was, was a, an attack on, on imperialism. 
And you can see, I think you can see this today in the fact that, you know, the Cuban flag is, is the symbol of, of the revolution. Um, still today, it's not, you know, as much as I like the red flag, you know, the Cuban flag is, is, is really the, the symbol of the gains of the Cuban revolution and the struggle against imperialism there. Um, yeah, and I think but this is a lesson that we can take from the Cuban revolution and we can look at um, how it applies to other uh, national struggles. Uh, I think this was something summed up in what James Connolly said as well, when he said that if you, um, if you took down the Union flag and raised the green flag over Dublin Castle today, then England would still rule Ireland through its, its bankers and its companies and all of the, the um, economic connections, the, the unequal economic connections between um, Britain and Ireland. Uh, and this is something that has very much borne true, though today Ireland is not so much ruled just by British capital, but by you know, these huge international businesses anyway, like, like Google and Apple. Uh, but this is this is a lesson that, that we can take, you know, to, to all I think every national struggle, whether we're looking back at in 1948, uh, sorry, not 1848, not 1948, with the you know the springtime of nations, the sort of some of the first national revolutions. It was ultimately, you know, the the links between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy that that ended up smothering and betraying them, to the the Brexit um, question in Britain, you know, the question of, oh, can we be economically independent? Are we better off in the EU or outside the EU? When really it's not a question of, you know, uh, being in the EU or out of the EU. It's about um, capitalism in Britain. You know, we're, we're going to be just as powerless, whether in the EU and outside of the EU, if we, if, if we, you know, are within the capitalist system. And even and, and even taking it, it further yeah. to um, like the Kurdish national struggle, um, where we've seen you know very um, you know heroic struggles against um, Islamic extremism, like um, you know vicious reaction, um, undercut completely um, by by imperialism and by um, some of the the Kurdish um, bourgeoisie and the Kurdish Kurdish you know capitalist politicians, particularly. In Iraq, undercutting um, this struggle for the sake of um, maintaining capitalism in, in those countries. Um, so I, I think that, that this lesson that there can be no kind of independence under capitalism uh, is an important one because you're always going to be subject to this this um, global system of capitalism. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Sam. Okay, I'm going to change it. Felt like we were being taken on a world tour from Ireland to uh, to Kurdistan. Do you want to go ahead, um, Keelan, and answer a question on the Q and A? Yeah, sure. Well, I just saw quite an uh, an interesting question just like in the in the chat um, from someone called um, Kathleen about the, the sort of it, like how how do how do we sort of expect uh, kind of marginalised groups, uh, working class people, organise for a revolution when um, you know, like sometimes like theory can be fairly alienating um, in this kind of thing. I think like, but personally, I feel, I think, you know, I think actually like I would never, I would always say never underestimate the capacity for uh, working class people to grasp the most complex uh, of economic and political issues way better than uh, bourgeois academics, right? Like I think that's something I would always, always uh, want to stress. Um, but also, like fundamentally, I think um, you know a lot of the the key lessons uh, of of um, the workers workers to kind of uh, learn and, and this kind of thing often don't come off the back of them having sat down and read Capital, right? Like you know, a handful of uh, workers obviously go through this this process. So obviously, a few of the people who gathered here today might have went, well went through this process. But um, on the whole, obviously, it's kind of events that forge. This revolutionary understanding of, of, of society and the need to change it, right? It's the events of of uh, econ economic catastrophes that uh, that really pose the question of why, uh, you know, wh why is the system the way it is, and is this should, can this continue, and is something else possible, and th these kind of things, and you know, strikes can teach the workers 
extremely important lessons on their own collective strength and this kind of thing. And I think, you know, it's important to stress in the context of the Cuban revolution, that some of the most radical layers of workers were some of the most marginalized. Um, the the Afro-Cuban uh, sort of population, uh, Afro-Cuban workers, were some of the most uh, strong and vehement defenders of the Cuban revolution and uh, and actually also put forward some of its demand, uh, some of the more radical demands of the, of the Cuban revolution as, as well. I think, um, you know, in terms of like discussing these marginalized groups, so I think like that's what I kind of try to say to that. I think obviously like, you know, the, the, the role of a Marxist isn't to like brandish uh, das Kapital and read it out in a factory. Uh, I think that's always going to be an, a fairly alienating experience. But I think like we, you know, whoever has the the time uh, and the inclination to to read Marxist theory has to take the and draw the lessons and sort of use to take the lessons from it and try and uh, explain and convince fellow kind of workers of uh, the necessity for a social transformation. That's how Marxists organize, right? And I think that's what's important. Uh, that that would be my kind of answer to that question. Absolutely. Um, I think it was, was it, was it a Larkin quote, which goes along the lines of oppressed people feel weak before their oppressors, um, despite their numerical superiority, because they are on their knees, let us rise. And I think that really gets to the essence of what a revolution is. It occurs when, you know, these overwhelming, overburdening feelings of weakness, of helplessness are overcome. You know, when the mass of people suddenly think, I can't take this anymore, and they act accordingly. We certainly saw that throughout 2019, um, which was characterized by these re these revolutions, by these mass mobilizations. And I think, you know, it's it's certainly 2019 is really a window onto what's going to occur as soon as pa this pandemic blows over. You know, people are very angry, um, and I, I, you, we're seeing, for example, in Britain, you know. There was initially popularity for Boris Johnson, um, but it's turned into its opposite. Within the space of a week, you know, he is suddenly going down in the polls. People are angry for very good reasons, are asking all of these questions. Um, so I think, you know, it is going to be, it's going to open up a very turbulent period ahead uh, as far as struggle goes. Uh, and that's why, you know, we need to be discussing these lessons from the past um, for certain. I, I was going to answer um, one of the questions, which is the differences between the Cuban and the v Venezuelan revolution. And I'm going to start my intervention with a quote, which I think is really relevant uh, to today, looking onto, you know, kind of like the devastation that's occurring within Venezuela. And the quote goes like this, those who make a half, re half a revolution dig their own graves. Um, and I think this is the tragedy of the Bolivarian Revolution, because what we've seen, uh, you know, very similar with Castro and with um, his name has gone by Chavez. <laughs> Sorry, um, is being pushed further to the left by this mass movement and people that vehemently defend, you know, the gains that have been made by the revolution. Um, but so what happened in Venezuela is enough economic and political power was left in the hands of the opposition, the capitalist class, you know, their lackeys, that they could subvert and they could sabotage the political program. You know, Chavez himself admitted that socialism hadn't been achieved in Venezuela. Um, and, you know, now they're paying the price for that. You know, in Maduro is kind of caught in this impossible situation where he's making concessions to the capitalists. But, you know, with, with, uh, with eating comes appetite. You know, they, they want the whole bakery. They're not going to settle for, you know, like these meager reforms that are being offered um, by, by Maduro. They won't be happy until he's ousted, until, you know, like the 20 years of, re of gains that have been made by the Bol Bolivarian Revolution are reversed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Castro was certainly pushed in this direction, as Keelan spoke about. You know, when, when he first, uh, after, after, I think it was in January 1959, he was speaking on the radio and he said, you know, I'm not a communist, I'm not a capitalist. You know, my, my army isn't a red army, we're, a, we're an olive green army. Um, and I think he was pushed by, you know, the realization basically that to carry out these bourgeois democratic reforms, you had to break from capitalism. Um, and that is a conclusion that though Chavez may have reached it himself, it was never implemented. And we see, you know, the, the devastation that is caused 
when you allow, you know, the capitalists to sabotage uh, a very progressive, um, you know, worker based um, revolution. So, yeah, I, I wanted to say that. No, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think like it's, it, you know, it's also like worth probably pointing out the tragedy of um, of like Fidel as influence in the, in the uh, Venezuelan revolution is he actually played a similar role to the Soviet Union with regards to uh, encouraging them to slow down the pace of the, their reforms and, and not, not to rock the boat. Um, you know, unfortunately that, you know, that may well have influenced the, the decision to make half a revolution. Mm. Um, do we have anyone else wanting to come in? If not, I can uh, answer a question I've just seen. I can answer that question about the relationship between Che Guevara and the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, we don't have anyone that wants to come in right now. So this is uh, an encouragement if people would like to, to contribute um, and keep keep the questions coming in. I mean, there are a lot of questions that I'm sure we, we might not be able to come back to all of them, but we'll do our best. And if not, you can you can find us on Facebook afterwards um, and we'd be happy to continue the discussion there. But yeah, come back to the, the question that you saw, Keelan. Yeah, so I just saw one about like kind of a uh, comrade pointed out that um, often Che Guevara was at, at odds with the with the Soviet bureaucracy, right? And actually, so too was uh, Fidel Castro. At one point in the mid nineteen sixties, uh, they were very close to like a split between Cuba and the Soviet Union because uh, Castro wanted to e export the revolution, right? Like as I mentioned, this kind of uh, the tragedy of the Foucault theory's uh, implementation in Latin America. But nonetheless, it was a genuine attempt to try and spread uh, the revolution uh, into, into Latin America. And uh, this completely contravened uh, what I was talking about before with regards to the Soviet Union's um, peaceful coexistence, right? Like it was rocking the boat. Uh, you know, so the Soviet Union had largely accepted the Monroe Doctrine itself. They accepted that Latin America and Central America were the, the, the sort of the backyard of, of the United States and it was their sphere of influence and it was not to be. It was not to be messed with, essentially. And there you know, was Cuba completely defying this and trying to incite a continental-wide struggle against uh, against imperialism. And so there was a there was a, a an opening of a split. I think that's ultimately the, the the heart of that confrontation was this was the essentially internationalist policy. But all the the faults of the Cuban revolutionaries and the fact that they still implemented a bureaucratically planned economy, they were still kind of internationalists. And I think that. The legacy of that is obviously what we're seeing today with the sending of medical brigades across the world and this kind of thing. They were far more genuine internationalists than the Soviet bureaucracy uh, was, uh, you know, at, at any point. And I think uh, that's the that was the the point of uh, contention. But I think it's also important to note that by 1967, Fidel Castro kind of rolled back his program partly because obviously the Foucault theory had failed so spectacularly. That, and that was basically the, the conception for how do we spread this revolution was very much like we do what we did in Cuba and they didn't really have any other kind of out on how, how to go about uh, encouraging the spread of revolution. Unfortunately, because there were, there were grounds for it. It's not that, you know, I talked about the objective conditions for revolution being really heavily present in Cuba in the 1950s, but they were heavily present in other countries as well. And there were really uh, revolutionary movements, you know, that one of the kind of tragedies of, Che Guevara's intervention in Bolivia was it maybe he'd have had an entirely different story had he connected with the mine workers strikes. Sorry, if he connected with the mine workers strikes that were extremely militant, uh, perhaps we'd be talking about uh, a very different situation in, in, in Latin America. Obviously, it's impossible to know. But and this is, you know, this is the situation. Right. And I think uh, that's, you know, but as I say, Castro rolled back in, in 1967 partly because he, he feared what it would mean for Cuba to completely isolate itself. And so he makes a speech in 1968 uh, praising the Soviet put down of the Prague Spring. And, it, and, he, and he praises it precisely because he wants to basically not, like he's, it's him offering an olive branch to the Soviet bureaucracy, right? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll play the game um, in, order to, in order to guarantee like the continued purchase of Cuban sugar and the supply of Soviet oil and this kind of thing. Um, but you know that's I think it's still important. It's, it's still an important point to raise of that that kind of genuine um, split between the, the two um, the two sides, if you like, and the genuine internationalism espoused by Cuba. I think, and that is also another reason why I think Cuba serves to be much more of an inspiration than 
kind of the Soviet Union in, in kind of popular culture and, and, and today and this kind of thing. I think that's another aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that's a really interesting point uh, about the legacy of the Cuban Revolution. Like, we have to think about, you know, the foreign policy at the time. Um, and I think it was in 1961 that, you know, the first shipment of weapons was going to Algeria to help the, uh, the liberation movement there, the FLN. And it, this continued for the next 30 years, actually, throughout, throughout, um, throughout Africa. And that's why, you know, there is this reverence um, in Africa today for Fidel Castro. Like when he died, um, the, Algeria went into national mourning, I think, for about a week or slightly, slightly over. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've got a list here. It was helping, uh, it was active in Africa supporting na national liberation struggles. Algeria in 1961-63, Congo in 1965, Ethiopia in 1974, and Angola um, in 1975-89. to 89. Um, So I think it, it, it does have a very impressive uh, record or, or as far as internationalism goes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment that. That's a really good point. Um, and I think it's... It is like definitely one of the uh, enduring um, kind of as you say, legacies of the of, of the revolution. Like it's absolute commitment to uh, the struggle of kind of like uh, um, the oppressed peoples of the world, right? Like it was it has always served that as a beacon of, of that. And I think like it's kind of been watered down in many ways. I think today, I think its internationalism is in the form of medical brigades um, rather than AK forty sevens. But like it's still. You know what I mean, but it's still it's still like very much a part of Cuba's approach um, to for, uh, to foreign policy, right? Which is a foreign which can't, I really cannot be uh, seen in anything else, and it can't really be explained as well by like real politic, right? It's not um, it, it doesn't really offer it offered them no real initial advantage to to send doctors to Italy, right? There's nothing tangible to be gained. Likewise. Um, and actually, in a, good, a good, really good example of this is, the, is what you mentioned with regards to their support for Algeria. Um, the, in, the, in 1963, I think it was, um, there was actually a conflict that broke out between Morocco and Algeria. Um, Morocco wanted basically to claim territory off Algeria. And uh, at the time, Morocco was, was negotiating a trade deal with Cuba to buy a certain amount of its sugar. And it was, um, and, and it was a deal that would have provided Cuba with um, a significant amount of, of foreign capital, which it was in desperate need of because of the embargo and this, this kind of thing. But it still decided to send uh, soldiers in support of Algeria, um, who was always defend, being, defending against like uh, an aggression from a foreign power, foreign power backed by uh, US and French imperialism as well. And uh, it basically risked uh, having that trade broken, which would have, uh, which would have been a, a major uh, loss for for the Cuban government at that period. And I think that really uh, is testament to the fact that this isn't like, you know, some people often claim it's cynical, right? Like the reason Cuba does this is because it wins them international support and uh, it's just trying to cling on this kind of thing. I think actually, historically, they've proven that it's not all just about kind of real politic and, cyn and cynicism, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to have a look on the Q&A section to see if there are any more questions you want to answer? Um, we can draw the meeting to a close, though, if um, if there are no pe more people that want to contribute. So it's either speak now or forever keep your peace. Um, There's a good question about Angola. If if no one else wants to answer that, I'm happy to talk about. I mean, it, people might be sick of my voice by now. <laughs> uh, no, I am. But um, like, if if uh, no one wants to come in, I can try and speak a bit about that. Yeah, do you, do you want to gather your thoughts for a bit and I can explain what the MSF is just for people that have... Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I, I'll explain a little bit more about the Marxist Student Federation once people gather their thoughts. So the MSF um, aims to build an organisation of students educated in the ideas of Marxism. You know, I think time and time again, experience has shown that if we want to fight cuts, if we want to fight fees, um, and if we want to fight against the privatisation of education, um, then we need a clear socialist program for the student movement. I think the one thing that makes the MSF really stand out as an organization is its emphasis on theory. You know, theory for us is a guide to practice. You know, a lot of comrades describe theory as the living memory of the working class, um, which I think is quite apt because it really, you know, to transform the world, we must first understand it. 
uh, you know, then the world situation today really shows how capitalism is horror without end. Um, as it threatens to plunge us further into barbarism. And I think that makes the tasks of revolutionaries, you know, inspired by these events um, of the past and with the genuine ideas that can change the world ever greater. Um, it's also worth noting that we're uh, affiliated to Socialist Appeal, the Marxist voice for labor and youth. And if you haven't already, I'd urge you to take out a subscription for our paper um, and our theoretical quarterly. You know, you can find all of this information on Socialist Appeal's website if you'd like to Google that after, after the talk is finished. Um, and as far as a plug for our paper goes, you know, it's certainly better than what you'll read in The Guardian. And it can cost as little as 50p a week. So I'd, I'd recommend everyone, you know, in order to keep up to date with, you know, the current events, the, the sudden twists and turns, um, the analysis that's provided in our paper is absolutely excellent. So yeah, that's a little bit about the MSF and uh, and Socialist Appeal. Uh, if you like the ideas that we've been speaking about, join us. Um, you know, there's. I, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back on to Keelan now. Cheers, cheers. Thank you very much, Carl. I think yeah, um, I think that's absolutely like, you know, I think it's a really good point to be raised by Carl and something that Carl was mentioning before which is that like, we aren't discussing this just because it's interesting, right? The Cuban revolution is, at least to me, uh, like a fascinating thing, right? Like it's, it was, you know, this incredibly, um, you know, heroic struggle for all these various reasons and this kind of thing. But, uh, you know, ultimately these discussions are precisely to arm ourselves um, with, with the theory necessary to, to bring about the same kind of, of transformations that took place in Cuba. We study these revolutions in this series about uh, revolutions, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, studying them precisely so that we can, uh, you know, have our own, right? And that's ultimately our ambition, right? It's not just uh, navel gazing and, and uh, kind of a academic, um, kind of, yeah, kind of academic nonsense. Basically. Academic intrigues. Intrigues, exactly. That, thank you, Kyle. Uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about actually being able to arm ourselves with the theory that will be, enable us to, to carry out uh, a social transformation uh, ourselves essentially but uh, yeah I'll come on to the question of um, apartheid and the role that Cuba played in bringing down apartheid and, with Angola and this kind of thing so comrades may, may not be aware that like during the 1960s and 70s in particular uh, there was a kind of revolutionary struggle in Angola against the Portuguese who still owned um, who still had like colonial possession of Angola and Mozambique as well and Guinea-Bissau and so there were these anti-colonial struggles against the Portuguese and the South African uh, government, which was obviously an apartheid government, was backing, uh, initially backed the Portuguese government, but when it realized that they were going to, to lose, it began to back a kind of um, certain reactionary forces in Angolan society. Um, and it backed kind of, these reactionary forces were also obviously backed by US imperialism and so on and so forth. And uh, but backing the, the sort of Marxist, uh, or at least ostensibly Marxist revolutionaries Angola was with the Cubans, uh, and the Cuban uh, government actually sent 30,000 troops into this Ang into Angola to fight the civil war on the side of the only sent troops into into Angola, and it was an absolute catastrophe for South Africa. One, it kind of shattered the illusion of kind of um, you know like one their, their their notions of racial superiority. Right, they'd just been like bested by an army comprised largely of Africans and Cubans. Like this, their, no, the notion that uh, the the, the white people were uh, superior, obviously was shattered by the, this event. And also it, it, it completely uh, undermined their position in Namibia because South Africa could basically directly control Namibia, which is a, a which is obviously now a nation, but was a territory uh, in between what is now South Africa and Angola. So it actually played quite a significant part in undermining and bringing down the apartheid state. It was an immense uh, kind of shock to the, uh, to, the, to the government. It inspired as well, uh, Africans across South Africa, right? Like it ins inspired people because it was all of a sudden a regime that had been seen to have been kind of um, un undefeatable had been bested. And, uh, and, and so it kind of spurred on the revolutionary events taking place in South Africa. And also it was, it was a sort of, um, it was a hugely expensive um, kind of escapade for the South African government, which really put itself in, a, in an even more precarious position. Uh, with regards to kind of holding on to its uh, its position and the fact that uh, you know apart imposing apartheid was no uh, 
kind of cheap um, political program, right? It required immense coercive force. So I think, yeah, I think it's definitely right to appraise Cuba's role and contribute to that. Obviously, I think, I think it's important to stress the fact that ending of apartheid ultimately came off the back of the struggle of the working class in South Africa, right? And the, and the struggle of the masses in South Africa was what overthrew apartheid. Um, I think obviously it's fairly important to, um, to stress that it, the, the role of uh, the, the kind of blockade was very limited, mainly because Britain and the United States didn't join it for most of the period of apartheid. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, it's, but nonetheless, I think definitely worth appraising the role of Cuba. And also, again, it links to what we were talking about before in terms of uh, international solidarity as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you nailed that question. Um, there, there's a question that's been asked um, about protecting the gains of, of the revolution and, and what we can do, because, of course, you know, Cuba is going to be quite hard hit uh, by this, um, by the tourist industry, basically not being able to function uh, under, under COVID-19. I think, you know, we should we should really broaden our horizons when it comes to this like because i think the best thing we can do to ensure that the uh the gains of revolutions that have occurred uh throughout the world is through building the forces of marxism and ensuring that you know when the time comes we can successfully have a socialist revolution and we can transform uh society mm -hmm. along socialist lines in our own country and you know this would be the spur you know it'd be the spark that would you know satellite world revolution uh we're already starting to see the world in complete turmoil so i think you know building building the forces ensuring the success and taking a genuinely internationalist perspective as well because they, there are certain gains that need to be defended in the situation in cuba uh, but a political revolution is required um so that's that's how i would answer that question no i think that's absolutely spot on i think uh, ultimately like um it's similar to, to when people kind of, um, you know, for, the, for, for, for very good reasons, people often say like, um, it wasn't the situation in, in kind of um, the underdeveloped world or the third world or whatever you want to call it, like, isn't that so much worse than the situation of, of workers here and this kind of thing? And, you know, there are numerous problems that you can have with that argument, but, you know, at the end of the day, the, the best thing that we can do as, as, uh, as workers in Britain is build the forces of Marxism in Britain and, and prepare for the revolution in Britain uh, and the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism in Britain. That is the single greatest thing you can do to help like any people of, of the people of Cuba, people of Angola, what, what have you, right? Because it's on the basis of that social transformation that will act as a, as a, as a, a beacon um, for workers across the world and would also enable, for instance, you know, we talk about, uh, it's been kind of touched upon, right? Like, why would a revolution here be on a more firm basis than a revolution in a place like Cuba? Well, obviously, Britain is an advanced capitalist power. It's got the most advanced uh, capitalist techniques and, and so on and so forth. Uh, much greater uh, amounts of sort of capital just sitting, uh, to, waiting to be utilised for the good of, um, of humanity. Um, and it would be able to, to quickly spread this capital and these, te these advanced techniques and so on and so forth to places like Cuba, right? Like, in a way that capitalism will never enable for the for these methods to be to be shared because obviously you're in competition with with other nation states under under capitalism obviously so i think that's i mean that's the key i think the key lesson right i think that's why we've we both kind of uh plugged the idea of getting involved um because it's important because ultimately if you want to see the cuban revolution maintain its gains it's enormous gains in healthcare it's enormous gains in education it's enormous gains in kind of uh, racial equality and gender equality as well. If you want to see that, the best way to ensure that is to build the forces of Marxism and overthrow the rotten ruling class that we have in Britain. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's an excellent place to, to leave the meeting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in on the live stream as well. A video will be put up shortly on the YouTube channel, I'm sure. Uh, and we have a meeting next week on Haiti. So I hope to see you all there. Um, you know, we, or oh, just, just finally, actually, to plug this book, you know, this is a, this is a book that's being produced um, by our independent Marxist uh, bookshop, Well Read Books, um, which of course is at the moment struggling with 
shipping of books and this kind of thing and the everyday maintenance. So, but they have made um, eBooks for pretty much everything. And if you want to hear more about what's going on in Cuba, um, what's going on in Venezuela and Nicaragua, this is the book to buy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I knew that I had one final plug before I'd end this meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you very much for attending. Um, and I hope to see you all next week.